wishing you all happy whale festival and uh, welcome to the Noyo Center Science Talk for March, the 16th of March. Um, we're absolutely thrilled to have this panel and have uh, Jeff Jacobson in the house next to the orca here. Jeff came down and um, has been helping me uh, clean up some baleen and soak some sea lion skulls and different things here and there, head down to the harbor. Um, and um, celebrating whale festival, it's a tradition that goes way back. Um, this area, um, it started in the 60s when they were celebrating uh, or actually working to protect the gray whales that were being seen off of our coast and in times when people could actually see the uh, whaling boats offshore. So a bunch of crazy coastal folks got together and started bringing awareness to the gray whale. And that tradition holds true today in um, many, many ways. Um, interesting tiptoeing out of our houses into the public world is, is kind of a, a spooky thing right now, but I think we're, we're doing it. You know, we're going to become less and less isolated, I do hope. Um, but coming together via Zoom, coming together in person, whatever it may be, um, coming together to get out to watch whales together or not. Um, the whales are bringing us together in different ways. Um, so uh, we do ask if people don't mind, if you would go ahead and donate a $10 donation to the Noyo Center. It's greatly appreciated to keep these engines running. We um, survive by donations. We survive by volunteer hours. Um, so contribute in any way that you can to keep this, keep these science talks going, um, keep us running, and, um, and as well, just show support for these fine speakers and these fine scientists that have come together tonight. Thank you to each and every one of you for the work that you do and uh, for being here with us tonight. So the Noyo Center welcomes you, and I will turn it over to Jeff Jacobson to introduce our fine speakers. Thanks again, everybody, for being here with us. And I think Trey will put that link down in the chat if you if you don't have it. But just go to noyacenter.org and you can click and give us a donation if you like, or stop in and see us here at the Discovery Center. Uh, the blue whale bones, they're out. They we brought our blue whale out for the first time in in these last, you know, one of two years. I think it's been over two years that we've had her stored. Um, we've laid her all of the bones out. It's incredible breathtaking, wowing to see the blue whale skeleton laid out. It's beautiful. Our volunteers have been welcoming people, uh, visitors from near and far and students from, from near and far. So hooray for the team, hooray for our volunteers and um, celebrate all of you and the energy that is around whales. <laughs> all right, thanks. Hello. Um, yeah, there's a great diverse series of talks coming up and storytelling from a variety of perspectives. Uh, Tree and Scott will talk about the whales that they've been watching for, oh, they'll tell you how long. I've, it's too long for me to remember. And um, off their place and making counts is that long-term data set is invaluable for efforts like that. And they've just taken it upon themselves to do it. Uh, Justin Visbeke runs the Stranding Network all up and down this coast and networks with all the and other networks uh, along this coast and um, nationwide, uh, amazing busy work. And then Kia Hayes will talk to us about uh, the contaminant work that she's done. Everybody wonders about these gray whales that live so close to us, what their contaminant loads are. And yeah, she was one of those kids that grew up and wanted to be a whale biologist and jumped on board my boat, which you can see behind her and uh, has done it. And just has wow. So I'm learning lots from her from here on out. So we'll start start with Tree and Scott and uh, take it away. Okay. In the interest of time, uh, I'm going to give an, an overview of what we do, and then uh, Tree will be back to discuss um, our numbers over the years. And of course, nothing happened. <laughs> just just uh, I wanted to remind everybody, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll, we'll stay on top of that. And again, um, 
hopefully if we miss your question during the speakers, we will get to your questions at the end. We're happy to stick around for a bit. We'll let um, you ask questions as, yeah. As and a panel ahead. discussion is involved so that everybody can chat in. Okay, we're all set here. Okay, we do 80% um, of our observations from the Point Arena Lighthouse, which is just south of um, Fort Bragg in Mendes, the town of Mendocino. Uh, it's a good vantage point because it ex extends out into the ocean for two miles from where it leaves the Pacific Coast Highway at, at um, Lighthouse Road. And uh, we'll go back here again. That's uh, Wife Tree on the left. And I'm obscured here on the right, but um, you can see me on the screen. Uh, that's the Point Arena Lighthouse there. And in real life, these rocks aren't here. Um, they're actually from where we sit out here outside the uh, lighthouse gate, the, uh, these rocks are actually further over to the right. So we're not actually looking straight at them. But uh, that's the lighthouse here, which is the tallest lighthouse on the West Coast, but we don't watch from up here. We watch from down here. And the traditional way that whales, gray whales go down the coast is the Northern route and they kind of hug the coast. I'm gonna show you some areas here where we see whales coming from. Um, when they come down, right down the north, the whales have read the right books and they come right down from the north. They um, go along here outside these rocks and then they get on a southerly track and head down. Uh, we also see whales coming out of the northwest here. Uh, very tall blows quite often we can spot on a decent day when there aren't so many white caps. And then to our surprise, um, every year except for this year, we've seen a great deal of whales coming out of the west northwest over in here. So right at the edge of where you can see the, the ocean. So uh, those are the three areas that we, we see whales from, from the um, coming in inbound to us. Uh, we have whales that travel close to shore and we have whales that have been feeding here year round off the peninsula and off of uh, nearby areas like the town of Gualala that we live in. This is a photo by Ron Lavalley who is associated with uh, the Noyo Center. And it gives you a good look at the modeling along the sides of a gray whale. It makes it possible to photo identify them, which is a project we just recently started uh, with a neighbor. And you can see all this modeling here that makes it possible to photograph the flanks of these right wh gray whales and uh, tell one from another. Okay, how, how often and how long do we observe? Uh, we now have, we're now approaching 6,000 hours that we've been um, sitting out here looking for, I can't say looking at whales, looking for whales until we do see them. We spend between four and seven hours a day depending on the, the um, weather and ocean conditions. Uh, when we don't go back to New England in the summer, uh, if we're here year round like we were in 2020, um, we observe 12 months of the year, but most of the time it's October through May most years. And we begin observing and looking for whales as soon as we arrive back here in the, on the West Coast and um, continue observing until we leave, if we do go back to Maine in uh, May or June. Uh, we count and record migrating whales, um, both north and southbound, and any other species of uh, whales, I mean, marine mammals we see, but especially whales. And we also note the weather conditions and the behaviors of uh, any particular whale. Uh, first, our first southbound whales seen were um, in December, December 1st this year, uh, which coincidentally is when Point Vicente and um, Lisa Shulman Janiger starts up her program down there, which has been running for 38 years. But just by coincidence, our whale, our first sighting for the southbound was December 1. The greatest number of southbound we've seen uh, this year on, on a single day was 78 on January. Um, Greatest number of southbound whales seen in two weeks was 435 during the weeks of January 10 to 23rd. And that was 42% of our total southbound count for this year. And uh, first northbound whale was seen, I'm obscured here, I can't see the. Oh. Oh. No, it's just the, uh, I don't know how the people can either. It was February 7th. Uh, February 7th, okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, first northbound whale seen was February 7th. To go back up here a little bit, the, um, our first southbound whale was on January 8th, uh, December 1, and we had a high of 
highs count on one day on January 8 of 78 southbound. And the, the 435 we saw during the weeks of January 10 to 23 represented 42% of our total count of southbound uh, for this year. Um, one thing I want to note, mention here is that normally the last eight years, we have seen our highest counts of southbound gray whales at the end of January, like January 25, 26, 27, we would have 70 to 90 uh, whales a, a day during, those, during that last week. But this year was different. We had our high numbers the uh, first week of January, uh, first uh, week or two of January, and uh, then it began to die off from there. Our first northbound whales seen this year were on February 7th. That doesn't mean the end of the southbound. That's just when we saw our first northbound. And for about two weeks every year, we have them going in both directions, which is both funny to watch at times, but also takes a lot of concentration because we want to be concise about what direction they're going. And often we see the blow, and if it's at all choppy and a lot of white caps, it's very hard to track the whale to see what direction it's actually going in. It sounds easy, if they're going this way, it must be north, they're going that way, it must be south, but it's not quite as, as cut and dry as it sounds. Hope we got another, not advancing. Okay, okay. Just go here. Oops. Oops. Like ping pong. Okay, yeah, the greatest number of northbound as of March 16 has been 44 on March 7th. And the greatest, okay, and these are to be determined. We don't know yet. We haven't, we're not done with northbound. We won't be for a while. And the first mother and calves and uh, total numbers are still to be determined. Okay, the whales that we, um, of the species that we've seen out um, here along the coast, the Mendonoma coast, and three, those of you not from the area, that's Mendocino and, and Sonoma counties, are the, uh, these nine or 10 species you can see here. The, um, other than the gray whale, the humpback whale is the whale we see most often. We've had gray whales uh, every year, thank God, since that's what we're counting, every year since we started in 2014. And humpback whales we've seen every, every season except 2014. Uh, minke whales are not seen too, uh, too often in this area, but we, we have seen them on three different years. And there's no one I was gonna point out here, but... No, um, the orcas, that's obscured here by the photos, but um, orcas we've seen uh, in four or five different years. Okay, and I just want to acknowledge our, um, I guess our colleagues from uh, NOAA down at uh, the Granite Canyon. This is Dave Weller and Amy Lang's group. And uh, we, we um, feed them information each day so they can see what they can hear or understand what whales are north of them or north of San Francisco and headed their way. And um, I'm really I'm really envious of this trailer they get to be in. And we also mentioned the uh, infrared thermal camera because that's going to come up in a few minutes here in, in this uh, presentation. And this is us here. We have a broken down porta potty behind us in the cow pasture. We don't have a trailer, but we do have a great view. And um, I put this quote in by Melville because uh, I want to drive home to people that there's, there's no substitute for field experience. You can take a lot of classes. I've taken a lot of classes. I've been taught a few. And um, but there's really no, uh, no substitute for field experience. And Herman Melville, before he wrote Moby Dick, did a lot of interviewing, did a lot of reading, but he also worked on a whale ship for months at a time to get the real idea of what um, the field work was like and working on a whaling ship before he could write Moby Dick. Okay, and the infrared camera again, um, Christina Tomback Wright, who many of you know, um, joined us around 2017, 16, and um, brought camera up to uh, field test here off of the um, tip of the uh, Point Arena Peninsula. And um, those of you who have worked for a while in marine field projects, you know how many things can happen. And everything that could possibly happen happened while Christina, the five days Christina was here, uh, from weather to even we even had a small earthquake and uh, a power outage, which rendered all of these power cords useless for a while. But uh, we all had fun. And um, one of the funniest things that would occur each day was there are always some whales. The idea was for the camera to pick up the blows of the whales which are about 100 degree Fahrenheit as they exit the whale's nostrils. And we wanted to see how well the camera could do that. 
but we had some whales that came along, blow, 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 dive, blow, blow, blow. So the camera never saw them. We saw the whales, but the camera never picked up the blows because they would manage to dive just when they got to the, uh, in front of the three cameras. And then the classic route of, a, of the uh, gray whales, which most of you have probably seen by now, they do hug the coast for the most part. Um, they enter the Bering Sea here through the uh, Unamak Pass and feed up in the Chukchi Sea, the Bering Sea here, and in the Beaufort Sea as well. And then when they're going south, back down the other way to the lagoons in Baja, some, some wander, <clears throat> some, excuse me, some wander into the Sea of Cortez, but not too many go, go much beyond the tip of the peninsula. Uh, these are the lagoons that they go into, and it's more of a um, nursery area for um, mothers to wait for their calves to be strong enough to swim 7,000 miles with them back up to the uh, Arctic feeding grounds. And another view here is the Bering Sea again, the Chukchi Sea, and this arrow uh, indicates where the Unamak Pass is, and this is the, the Unamak Pass is nine nautical miles wide, which is also unfortunately large enough for cargo vessels to win and out of, but uh, thousands and thousands of gray whales go through this pass to get up into their prime feeding grounds. And also killer whales, um, now they're very crafty and they will wait in this area for the gray whales to arrive, especially the mothers and calves. And some of them even escort the gray whales up in to the feeding grounds and been quite a, quite a high mortality of calves in this area. And what does Unimac Pass look like? Looks like this, um, wide and full of shearwaters. And our neighbor and uh, US Fish and Wildlife biologist, retired now, Doug Porcel, who lives at the, lives at the end of our street, uh, gave us a slide. It was taken by his colleague, Kevin Bell, who's uh, since passed away. But um, I asked Doug how many shearwaters he thought were in this photo, and he said, say million and then put any number you want in front of it. It's just an uh, inestimable, inestimable number of, of shearwaters here. And this is what whales swim through when they to enter the Bering Sea. Here's a whale here, bird, no, a whale, this is a gray whale here, which you can see well, and it's good to go. And then uh, that's another bird, a whale there and a gray whale there. So it's a busy spot and probably noisy. Now, when I first got into this, we decided we were going to do this. Um, I had taught about gray whales and I had seen a few since we had lived here in previous years. I had in the 70s and 80s. Um, I read the right books and when we decided to do this project, I thought, all right, um, we'll, um, it can't be too bad, but um, there we go. Um, by the second season, halfway through the winter, we got into the heavy count of migrating southbound whales. I began to have a lot of questions as to why down in Point Vicente, to the south here, they weren't seeing as many, as many gray whales as we were. I don't mean on a daily basis, because obviously we were north of them, so we were seeing whales first. But as time went on, um, and then I ran into Michael Smith, who was running gray whales count out of Santa Barbara, he was a huge help. He's, he's now retired, but he was a big help. And he told me that the whales come down, uh, we get the bulk of them going along the coast. About a point conception, uh, they begin to branch off into these various fingers. And, oops, touchy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, they go along the coast here, and this will take them past Point Vicente in Los Angeles. But there are these other branches here, and they get down around Tijuana, they begin to get back together and then into the lagoons. So that helped explain why um, some of the numbers seem to be a little bit off. And we did have um, quite a discrepancy, excuse me, this year with uh, the numbers that we had up in Point Arena and what the American Cetacean Society and Lisa Janiger's group had down here. And it's been a real head scratcher for Elisa and I. We've been discussing this quite a bit. And the obvious thing is that the whales must have swung way out to the west, a lot of them, you know, past her observation site in their census center. And, um, but we don't know why and we don't know how far out they went. But vessels 
moving around the Channel Islands did not observe or report any large numbers of gray whales out through here. So that's a bit of a mystery, which will someday hopefully be figured out. Okay, a project that we started here, um, because several years ago, we noticed that we had year-round gray whales here and we had year-round feeding by gray whales right off the peninsula and off the local beaches here. And this has been coordinated by Sherry Goforth, a neighbor of ours, another neighbor. And she's been photographing the flanks of the gray whales where you have this great modeling, very similar to the way you identify uh, blue whales, this great modeling, which is individual on both on each individual whale. So it kind of fingerprints them and they also get scratches and on them too, which helps identify them individually. But, um, and she's been working with some of the centers along the coast here, like um, Cascadia, sharing photos with them and with, um, Oregon State, Carrie Newell. Or Carrie Newell, right? I think it was her last name. Carrie Newell, who's been doing quite a bit of work um, for years. And some of these whales have been given names to like Supernova and Siggy here. Um, but we were interested in what the whales that we had here were doing. Were they sticking around a while? The only way you can tell that out, tell that is to be able to identify them individually. So it's one of Sherry's photos here taken um, in downtown um, Lalala in September, which is not a migrating month for gray whales. Another one, uh, Siggy in down of uh, Lalala Point Cove, which right here in town in September. And then this is just what it looks like. It's Lalala Beach, that's sand, that's a footprint right there. Um, people are coming down and watching um, whales like this one here feeding right off the shallow berm. And uh, like I said, that's beach sand right there. So they were very close and directed a lot of attention. And at first we we're getting calls that people, the whales were stranding. But it was just a whale that was feeding here year round, a non-migrator. And that was taken on October 22 by Sherry. And this is one I managed to take here. A whale named Spotlight, which was taken in September, another non-migrating month. And then uh, Rambo, actually Jeff helped me with this one. When we get this one, Jeff and John Callum Bokitas up in Cascadia Research. Um, it's a whale that's uh, well-traveled and been seen many times. Um, this was Rambo until Rambo showed up with the calf. And uh, so it became Rambolina. That, that happens quite a bit with the whales that are supposed to be one gender and turn out to be another. Yeah, and then um, we were also photographing whales that were injured along the way, there's Sherry there. And um, the rest here is courtship groups that we've uh, seen. And we get reported to us because uh, people think the whales are being attacked. This is the North Atlantic right whale here. It was a surface active group of 24 whales. And um, as you can see, this is part of a fluke of a North Atlantic right whale, but from a distance that could be mistaken for a, an orca dorsal fin. Uh, whales are rolling, trying to get away from each other. And some of this uh, is, is males trying to mate with disinterested females. And, um, and people see black and white and they see this and they think that um, there's an orca attack. Okay, I'm gonna uh, skip the rest of this and get to the data and tree will take care of that. This represents uh, the results of the past five years of our census going back to 2017-18 and divided into the months, December through April. Um, you could see how February is a challenging year for us because we have whales going both southbound and northbound. Um, mothers and calves uh, showed up um, in 2019-20. We saw them at the end of March, but normally we start to see them in April, May, and even a little bit into June. Uh, this is a graph of that same data, just so you could see trends, uh, how the, most of our southbounds pass by in January, um, and March is the main month for the northbound migration. Uh, this represents our whole entire uh, eight, and then this year, nine years of the census, showing you exactly how many southbound whales pass by for the entire season, as well as the northbound. So we had some increasing in southbound, then we took a decrease. Uh, this year, the southbound numbers were up. And finally, I, I wanted to show you an, uh, what we had this year compared to an eight-year average. Our eight-year average for 
uh, southbound was 1,046. This year we had 1,031. Our eight season average for northbound was 933. And so far this year we had uh, four, whatever it says here, I can't see it either, 486, I believe, um, and still counting those northbound. Okay, these are some of the groups that we um, coordinate with and share information with. Another Ron LaValley photo, and thank you. Um, we've all been hearing about all the gray whales that have been coming up on the beaches dead lately and how many are there. Well, Justin's going to give us a review of all the people that have been working on those every single whale that's come up that you can work on, the samples that have been taken out of it and the history of it and the prognosis and such. So take it away, Justin. All right, so thank you very much. My name is Justin Visbicki. I am the California Stranding Coordinator for NOAA Fisheries. Um, so yes, we have actually had what's called a gray whale unusual mortality event for the last couple of years. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of what we've been finding and looking at and, uh, and kind of what's been going on. So first and foremost, you know, what, what is an unusual mortality event or a UME? Um, and as you can see here, it, it really is something that's unexpected. It involves a significant die off of any marine mammal population and demands an immediate response. And so currently the gray whale UME is our, our only uh, UME that's running on the West Coast. We just recently closed a Guadalupe fur seal UME. Um, but, so this fortunately is our only on, you know, ongoing UME that we have in California. Um, the way that the UME works is that we've got a working group um, that's composed of a, a number of uh, scientists, experts, people that are really informed on gray whales and on marine mammals and different things. And then they help us to kind of decide what is the best path of action as we share the information that we're finding with them. Um, so the working group's role is to determine what it's, when a UME is occurring. Um, they're helping to direct our response and our investigation. And then they help us to determine when the event is actually over. So we take all of this information that we get and we're constantly presenting what we have to the working group and asking for their information as to what they think and how they feel about uh, the directions that things are going. Um, let me see here. So, all right. All right. And so, people always wonder, you know, well, how does that get paid for? And so, a lot of this, you know, comes from our UM, UME contingency fund. Um, and I'll be honest, there isn't a huge amount of money for these types of things, but there is some money um, that can help to fund some of the coverage. Um, that we have uh, when we have these, you know, kind of extended events that require, um, you know, really more involved knee crop. Did I get muted there for a second? My you did, but you're back. That's weird. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't touch anything. Um, <laughs> um, so the uh, the UME uh, funds can can help to 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 basically help us to figure out what's going on. But again, there's not a lot of it. Um, and so there, there's different ways that money can be put in there uh, over time, but it really is to help us to figure things out because it, as part of our stranding network, the network partners are only required a, a very small amount of information, what's called our level A data. Um, and the level A data doesn't necessarily include, include full-blown necropsies, sample analysis, and some of the things that we're doing um, above and beyond what's kind of normally required in these special situations that we feel um, garner more attention and more, you know, kind of an inquisitive look and, and scientific determination of, of what's actually happening out there. Um, all right, so now I can't change my screen. There we go. Okay. Um, and you guys have seen this picture before. This just kind of gives you some information. As you know, they, they do the, the migration up and down. What's interesting to look at is the graph on here, and you can kind of see, you know, the, the total numbers of gray whales uh, over the years. And if you look, kind of some interesting things to think about here. One thing is, is that we did have an unusual mortality event for gray whales back in 1999 and 2000. Um, and you can see the population was up around 20,000 animals, um, and that's when we hit that UME. Um, and then we've hit another one, uh, again, starting in about 2019. Um, and you can see the population there at that time was up to about, you know, a little bit over 25,000 um, and now has dropped down to, you know, probably a little bit below 20,000, uh, kind of right around that 20,000 area, um, which is kind of interesting. If you start thinking about carrying capacity of environments and things like that, you know, obviously we'll need to look at this further in the future, but that 20,000 number may be very interesting is that maybe, um, maybe indicative, indic indicative of somewhat of a carrying capacity. Now, Carrying capacities can always change 
because uh, it's really based upon you know what's out there and available for these animals and what's really important to them. Uh, but this just gives you kind of an idea of where we were at numbers, uh, numbers wise. And then the bottom graph down here shows the calves that are born annually. And you'll kind of see in these UME years, we have very lean calf years. And those are things that we're always concerned about because when you have lean calf years, um, you know, you've got really wide, solid bases, and then all of a sudden you have a real, you know, thin year where you don't have a lot of calves. There, there's always that risk that that small number may not be enough in the future. Now, obviously, with 20,000 whales, we're not overly concerned about that yet. Um, but anytime you have lean calf years, it's something that we kind of want to keep an eye on because those are, again, going to be the future kind of base for those animals that are going to be having calves in the future. Um, I won't talk much about the migration because we already did a great job of doing that. Um, so our gray whale UME actually covers from Mexico to Alaska. So all the way up and down the range of these animals um, started in about 2019 and it is continually ongoing. Um, we've got approximately about 500 whales that have come ashore. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the tricky part about this is that we haven't been able to find you know, one big smoking gun that's glaring out and saying, hey, this is the reason why all these whales are coming ashore. We're actually finding a number of things that are going on. And so it, it is somewhat interesting for us. Um, we have seen you know, some of our significant findings. We have seen um, in the live whales in Mexico that there's definitely thinner animals, um, thinner juveniles, um, you know, those non-lactating animals. We've, we're just seeing a lot smaller animals down there. Um, it is kind of interesting to note though, the females that were pregnant were actually doing pretty well over those couple of years, but the other animals that were not were the ones that were really not doing as well. Um, so what are some of the things that we've actually found during these necropsies? Well, we have found malnutrition. That is one of the things that we have found. Uh, human interaction, that's, that's a big thing in California. Vessel strikes and entanglements are uh, very high on the list for things that are causing problems for gray whales and, and resulting in deaths. Uh, we do see a significant number of those uh, pretty much every year. Um, kind of a side note on that, this is the first year we actually had um, a two for one, it's not a real good two for one. We actually had a mom and calf that were both entangled at the same time down in San Diego. And that's one of the first times I've actually seen that. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't able, we weren't able to get the team on the animals before they disappeared. So we don't know the end result of that. If both ended up staying entangled, if one of them got out, if both, you know, if, what actually happened with that. But having two whales entangled in the same gear at the same time is something that was uh, pretty rare for us. And that did happen this last year. Um, Killer whale predation, as you guys all know, that we, you know, as these whales swim along the coastline, they do face a number of challenges, and, and killer whales are one of those. Um, I know Monterey Bay is a real big area that we talk about in California, where uh, I get calls every year on the south side. These gray whales are sitting really close to the shore. What's going on? And then we hear the next day that there was a group of killer whales that were in the bay that were actually foraging and eating off of, you know, other killer off of the gray whales which would explain why those moms are then hiding their calves on the shoreline. They do not want to be attacked by those killer whales. So uh, killer whales definitely play a role in this. Uh, oops, excuse me, about, sorry about that. Um, and then disease testing. Uh, we, we haven't really seen a lot of the known viruses uh, that we've had and, you know, and there's a low background concentration of biotoxins and I'm not gonna say any more about that because I think there's gonna be some more discussion about what's going on um, you know, in these animals in just a couple minutes. Um, so our response, um, some of the challenges that we're facing is that, you know, these are obviously large animals. Um, it's not easy to, you know, go out and to sample them, to get into them. Um, the other part is that we've been in COVID. Um, and so COVID has been super challenging because normally we go out with these, you know, big groups of people, and the more people, the merrier, and the more easier it is for us. Uh, but now when you have to have, you know, limitations on the number of people that can be getting together, if everybody has to drive in their own car, does that mean we have to take 20 cars to go do the whale? Uh, just creates a lot more challenges for us. Um, and remote locations, you guys know all about that. Uh, there are you know, a lot of locations that are very challenging for us to get access to. Um, if they're down on a coastline where we can't even walk to, um, just, just really challenging areas for us to get access to. Um, the other challenging part is, is that unfortunately for us, you know, when they die, they don't just immediately come to shore. There's a flag that goes up and says, hey, I'm here, come and get me, look at me. Um, Typically, we find these whales in, in poor condition. They've been decomposing for days, weeks, or sometimes even longer. And so what we find is not ideal. The longer that whale's decomposing, you know, the more information that is going away over time. Um, some of the other challenges that we face is that you know, dealing with these carcasses, a lot of places when they come ashore, especially in Southern California, when a whale hits the beach, uh, if I'm lucky enough that it actually hits the beach, because lifeguards will sometimes talk amongst themselves, won't communicate with us, 
and we'll actually tow them offshore and just drop them somewhere. Um, and so it's really difficult for us sometimes to actually get access to these carcasses. Um, and then of course, when we do have them coming ashore, um, they don't want us opening them up. They want us to tow them off. How are we going to dispose of these things? And so it, it, it creates some challenges around, you know, ultimately we would love to take these things completely apart and really look at them, but then that leaves a pretty big mess on the beach. And so how do we deal with all of these things? Um, some of the other challenges, you know, these are transboundary migratory species. You know, these animals are, are going all over the place. They're crossing, you know, international borders and lines that, you know, they don't see, but unfortunately, politically and although societally, we, we have these lines, you know, drawn between our countries. And so that makes some challenges. Um, and again, we just don't know that, you know, we have some data gaps on, you know, what is going on, the nutritional condition of the migration, um, as well as we need, you know, more long-term monitoring of these populations. Uh, calf production in all three continu continuous countries. So we just, you know, we, we're, we're working on getting more information and working, you know, to be more in communication with some of these other countries. And it's definitely happening. Canada, I think we work really well with. I will say that Mexico has been a little bit of a challenge, especially the last couple of years. You know, they are really not super happy with this with tuna, you know, dolphin tuna issues and things that have been going on, as well as some of the other political stuff that's been going on. Um, just, you know, asking them to work with us has been kind of, they've, they've actually looked at us kind of laugh at us at times and said, ha, you want to work with us? So then that's interesting. Uh, that's not what we're hearing. So uh, we do have some challenges with some of these things. Um, all right, we already saw that one going this way. So just a couple of things. So carcass access and decomposition, just to give you guys some ideas of what we're talking about. So you can see you know, some of these harder to access ones down on the bottom left. The bottom right is probably a code four animal that basically really doesn't have much skin left on and it's been really rotting and you know we're not going to get a lot of information from that some of these ones that are floating out there we just don't get access to and then occasionally you know we do get some that we we get really good opportunities to, to work on um so here's a couple examples of the thin and emaciated whales and i just want to show you a couple pictures of this on the left hand side uh, that's what we call peanut head you may hear that a lot when we're referencing emaciated or skinny whales they've got the peanut head um, and that's just that shape of the head how it kind of goes up and then bows back down and then pops back up on the right upper you can see just how how skinny the whale is you can see the vertebral column running down the middle Normally, if that was a healthy animal, it would be very round all the way around. You wouldn't see those dents, but with these indentations, that's a good indication that these animals are uh, emaciated. I will even say, though, that sometimes the challenge is, is just the way they sit on the beach. There are times when a, an animal that is actually pretty healthy can sit in an angle or in a position that makes it look like it's skinny. And so we, we have challenges in kind of determining exactly how healthy they are. Uh, and, and how emaciated they are. But some of them are really obvious. Again, like the one on the left and the right there, it, it's pretty obvious that they are emaciated. Um, so some of the things that we're doing, you know, that we're, we're looking at, um, we're really looking at the environmental monitoring. And these are, again, some of the challenges that we faced in trying to figure out exactly what's going on. Uh, we're looking at the, you know, the environmental and the prey data to use integrated models we, to try to help us determine if there, you know, if there are causal factors that are consistent across the board. Um, data management, consistency, and integration. You know, think about this. We've got three different countries with multiple people in each of these countries going out on these animals and trying to be super consistent in how they're rating these things and how they're, you know, is it, is it emaciated, is it not? And so those are challenges. Um, integration of live whale information, baselines, behavior, body condition, abundance, and trends. We just, you know, we don't have a ton of information on these things. And so we're we're we getting it and then getting it all into one system where we can kind of integrate and look at it all together. Uh, carcass access is always a challenge. De disposal of necrops, we talked about that. Uh, contingency funds, you know, with some of our groups, uh, some of our smaller groups, and I'll be honest, you know, your guys' area up there is one of our more underfunded areas. These areas have challenges. Not a lot of people to go out and do it, not a lot of resources. Um, and I'll be honest, you know, finding people that want to go dig around in dead whales is, is, you know, it's not the easiest thing to do. It takes some, takes the, you know, particular person that wants to go out there and, you know, lose their sense of smell for the next couple of days and then go home and, and have their uh, friends and family and dogs really love them. <laughs> um, so it is definitely something that is different. Um, all right, let's see here. We did that one and keep going always. So that's, that's really, you know, most of what we wanted to talk about. But, you know, again, we just, we haven't found one kind of thing that's sticking out. And is, there are a number of challenges that kind of, you know, feed into all of that, but we are looking at it. Uh, I will say that this year so far, um, we have only had one knock on wood so far, um, dead whale strand in California. Um, so we are, you know, doing pretty well. Uh, I will say that, you know, we know that there's a lot of cryptic mortality going on out there. We don't 
you know, when these animals die, they aren't all coming ashore. Some of them are going to the bottom before we get to see them. Some of them, you know, we just, we, we just don't know how many are out there. So we know that there's definitely more going on than what we're seeing, uh, but we are seeing less this year, at least so far. And that's a good indicator. And if you do go back and look at that one graph, you will see that the last UME was only about two or three years. And then we transitioned and started going back up with the incline. So uh, our hope is, is that this year, you know, we talked about it earlier this year, if we have a very low year of strandings that we will be actually putting in for the closure of this UME. Um, and so far, so good. If we continue at you know, the rate that we're going right now, I think that most likely uh, we will be looking to close this UME uh, after this season. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Justin. Thank you so much. I don't see any questions in the chat, but if, if anybody wants to chime in real quick or, or put their question in the chat uh, real quick as we transition and welcome Kia, our next speaker. Time for Kia Hayes, who um, she recognized that the gray whales swimming off our coast here were closest to human contaminants and influence and put her head down and put an amazing study together, finished her master's on an analysis on um, improving the whole toxicology understanding of the gray whales taken from very small um, blubber and skin samples that we collect out of the whales using remote biopsy techniques. She participated in those collections and now is a full-time employee at NOAA uh, working through those contaminants. And uh, take it away, Kia. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for everyone that is attending and also for the organizers at the Noyo Center. Um, like Jeff said, I've been working on contaminant research in gray whales, um, starting with my master's at Texas Tech University and now through NOAA at the Northwest Fishery Science Center. So I'm actually up in um, Seattle. Um, my internet's been a little funky, so if I start to delay a lot, just give me a heads up and I'll try something else. <laughs> um, I can also already tell I probably have too many slides, but we're just going to summarize a lot and get all the great, exciting key points out. And then we also have a publication coming out soon. So if there's missing any information missing, you can follow up with the presentation. <laughs> OK, so I did want to provide um, a bit of background, though, for those that are not familiar with marine toxicology, which even on a good day is majority of people are not familiar with marine toxicology but probably most are familiar that there are many sources of pollution going into the marine environment and exposing um, a variety of marine organisms to different types of contaminants. But for the research that I'm presenting today, we're focusing specifically on persistent organic pollutants, or I'll be referring to them as POPs. So these are a group of chemicals that are originally produced for industrial, agricultural, and consumer applications. So this would include things like pesticides and flame retardants. Some of you may have heard of PCBs or DDTs. These are examples of POPs. Um, and there's been a lot of studies across the years that have shown these POPs to lead to toxic health effects to both humans and wildlife. And so due to this, there is a global treaty that was created in the early 2000s that has been working to eliminate and restrict the, pop, the production and use of these POPs. But still, these are very prevalent in the environment because they are very um, resistant to environmental degradation processes. So basically, they don't break down easily. They're persistent, hence the name. Uh, and then they're also easily transported across the globe via atmospheric and oceanic transport, and then have a tendency to deposit into uh, polar areas, so in the Arctic. So this is really important for organisms that are feeding in the Arctic regions like the gray whale. Um, and so anyways, yeah, with the distribution, the resistance to environmental degradation, we're still finding high wildlife burdens uh, of these pollutants, even post-regulation. Marine mammals in particular are very susceptible to bioaccumulating high levels of these lipophilic contaminants. So lipophilic just means that they're attracted to fat, such as the blubber. So in a, long, in a marine mammal's long lifespan, they are able to accumulate high levels in their large blubber lipid reserves. Um, and this puts them at risk to certain effects that have been studied um, in various species, which could include endocrine, disruption of endocrine, reproductive, and immune systems. Um, and then there's also some marine mammals are even more prone to high accumulation rates if they're feeding high on the trophic level. So this would be like a killer whale. They're going to have higher contamination levels 
than say a gray whale that is feeding lower on the trophic level. So with the susceptibility to accumulating and these known risks um, associated with POC levels, it's very important for us to monitor these contaminant levels in marine mammal populations, but it's very difficult to do so. There are limited or unavailable captivity studies for most of these whales, um, and then the free or free ranging wild populations of whales are very elusive and wide range. It's very difficult to study them, follow them around, and get biopsy samples from them. Uh, there are also a number of ethical considerations that we have to. Um, consider for marine mammal species. And we also know that there are a lot of individual and species specific variations that are really important for us to be able to properly interpret and design these population wide studies. So some of these interest species variations have to do with these life history parameters. And that's what a lot of my work recently has focused on. So this would include um, differences of pop levels according to sex, age, and reproductive events. So there's been a lot of studies across different species of marine mammals that have shown these parameters to influence pop loads. And the key driving factor of this is often pointed towards maternal offloading. So this is the offloading of contaminants from mother to calf that happens during gestation and lactation. So it obviously is influencing mother and calf loads, but, and then their males don't have this elimination route. So they're actually getting higher levels of contaminants across their lifespan. They're still accumulating where females are unfortunately, fortunately, dumping part of their load off to their calves. Um, and then there's a number of parameters factors influencing the severity of this maternal offloading, which could be species specific or other factors like birth order. The first um, offspring typically is getting the largest load of their maternal um, pop levels. Other things like the duration of their gestation and nursing periods could be influencing how much is being passed off to the offspring. And then other items like milk fat content. Um, gray whales, for example, have one of the highest milk fat contents. Um, and again, these are lipophilic contaminants, so they would be attracted to the fat inside the milk. Um, so yeah, a majority of this data that we do have for the influence of life history parameters is often coming from studies on pinniped and tooth whales, and there's a lot of data lacking for baleen whale species, which again is making it very difficult to interpret contaminant burdens on a population-wide scale. And these life history parameters have not been studied um, in a POP study for gray whales before. So that leads us to our gray whale study here. Um, we are focusing specifically on the eastern north population, eastern north Pacific population of gray whales, which is migrating along our coast here. And before our study, there was a 20 year data gap of contaminant monitoring in this population. So this is a very understudied species in terms of contaminant research. And we also have very limited data on how these life history parameters are affecting individual pop, individuals pop, pop levels. Um, so yeah, again, I began this project in my master's under the advisorship of Dr. Sling Goddard Cotting, and I'm now continuing it here at NOAA. And we've recently submitted our manuscript, so I'm going to be reporting some unpublished data, um, but I'm excited to share it with all of you. There's no studies before ours on maternal contaminant offloading, so we were looking to also confirm whether that is happening in gray whales. So to address our objectives, we have a really exciting, large and diverse sample set. And this was made possible through an extensive collaborative effort, both for sample collection across this wide range of their migration route, and also extensive access to individual IDs and like history records and citing um, records. So this is really exciting. And for those that are not familiar with the process of sampling whales, this is really difficult and it is a really exciting sample set. We have 120 biopsied whales ranging um, again from Southern Canada all the way down to Baja, California, Mexico, and between the years of 2003 and 2017. So this is the largest and most comprehensive sub sample set for a gray whale contaminant assessment. So for our key findings, we did find that overall there was a decline in mean pop concentrations um, at a population-wide level since the 90s and 80s. However, this was the first report of PBDEs and select HCH compounds. Um, so we're providing a more contemporary baseline levels and helping fill in this 20-year data gap for this population, which is really important. 
Um, but we do stress caution interpreting the risk because we um, still have more information that we're needing to get. Also, these may be low levels for these legacy compounds, but we really need to increase our assessment of novel compounds, which could pose additional threats. Um, so continued monitoring and contaminant of contaminants in gray wells is still very important, especially as the environment continues to change with climate change and increased human development activities. So this could be affecting um, contaminant transport and exposure of contaminants that were not included in this assessment. Our other key findings is that there was indeed significant influence of life history parameters on POP concentrations, and we confirmed maternal contaminant offloading in gray wells. And this is really important because we're both highlighting that maternal offloading is the underlying biological basis for these POP variations. Um, and also we're providing this framework for design and interpretation of our population-wide monitoring efforts and toxic risk assessment. And with that, I would like to thank my many, many wonderful, wonderful collaborators. Um, without them, this would absolutely not have been possible. So thank you. Any questions? Wow. Good job, Kia, getting all of that in there. Um, yeah, in thank you. Time. My goodness, what an incredible study. Um, one thing that did pop out, I think, to a lot of us was the high concentration in the minky whale on that one chart with the minky whales, there mm -hmm. seemed to be. What, do you have any idea what, what that was about? I'm not super familiar <laughs> with, with the minky whales. Um, but yeah, yeah, as with everything, there could be, um, yeah, just differences in, in prey sources, could be sampling of timing, could be, I don't know, a lot of different things. I'm not familiar with that specific um, study. They're, they're mostly fish eaters. And but then so is the humpback and mm -hmm. or the humpback krill and and fish. They're smaller. How would a smaller body size relate to accumulation of toxins? There's a lot of factors going into that. Oh, that's a good. <laughs> you answer. could have smaller body size but thicker blubber layers. You know, there's there's a lot of factors in that. Um, yeah, it was just on one of those. It just looked like the minky whale was way, way high. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that caught the eye of, of many of our watchful uh, listeners here in the chat. So so folks, do feel free to pop into the chat um, if you will have questions for Kia mm -hmm. or if you if anything came back, you know, for, to the previous speakers. Um, and uh, for anybody that's got anything better to do on a on the day before St. Patrick's Day, you're you're welcome to pop off if you if you need to. But for anyone else, um, speakers included, guests included, um, stick around. We can we we want to dive in. We want to um, answer questions. We want to have a conversation. And um, unless anybody has to leave of our speaker panel. Um, let us know and uh, let me take a start to peek at some of these. I see people are quest asking lots of questions, which is great. Um, what is the minke whale diet? So I think they're, they're feeding on, um, on schooling fishes um, more so than they are feeding on krill. There may be an expert here in the, in the panel that knows a little bit more about minke whales. Or they also feed more pelagically but than the gray whale. They're cryptic. Who knows? <laughs> cryptic <laughs> minkies. Yeah, uh, I think I think probably yeah. I think you hit both the main points there, though. And like I mentioned, with the biomagnification feeding higher on the trophic level, that would certainly be a, a strong influence of a of a higher overall pod level. Right, because they're, they're not eating krill. Um, what are the unique characteristics of the minky whale? It's a very small. Um, baleen whale, one of the, one of the smaller uh, baleen whales. And um, I think we've had a couple strandings here locally, um, both of which were, well, one was fully necropsied by the, the team at the Marine Mammal Center. I was a young female and her skeleton is, partial skeleton is here at the Noyo Center um, on display. Um, and then the other one uh, stranded and we just collected blubber um, and baleen of that one, a little male. Um, so really, they're they're pretty cryptic. Like the like the Mercers said, they they see them, they don't come up and be really showy and have huge blows. They're pretty small. They have like zero blow. <laughs> zero blow, and they they are aren't they pretty solitary? 
yeah as well yeah they're they, they fit all the categories for cryptic species that the sound they make is just really wild though too so it's what's that sound it's called the boing i mean oh right researchers have been hearing it for years and and submarine uh, acoustic operator has been hearing it for decades and it wasn't until recently they finally figured out it was minke whales making those sounds. It sounds like we've got a topic for a science talk. So if anybody knows a, a minke whale expert, let's let's uh, bring them here and and or encourage all of those up and coming marine biologists to study uh, beaked whales and minke whales because they're not as easy to study as the gray whales and the humpback whales and um, the more showy whales. And, and key is presentation is a living proof that you can get out in the field and do spend a lot of time in the field and learning amazing stuff from the animals. This is where the real teaching happens and learning and then dive in the lab and never see a whale again and, and produce great results is the two of them. To tie a little bit uh, Kia with Justin's, um, do you think that the toxin loads that you saw that are way down compared to back in the big DDT days and, and PCP days, um, how that might affect the health of the animal and com compromise it to get it to go strand on a beach and stuff or be more affected by a, a malnutrition and a UME. From the levels we've seen so far, I would presume that they are not, contaminant is not an influencing factor of the UME, but we are right now as we speak running contaminant analysis on a, a large set of UME whales. So I'm excited to to confirm that and make sure that is true, but based on the first round of the study, um, I wouldn't suspect that to be part of the UME. That's pretty exciting. I mean, considering that I, we didn't get as many uh, gray whales up here during the UME, which actually was kind of a lucky thing during COVID um, because uh, due to COVID, I was it was gonna be me out in the field unless I could possibly get a hold of anybody else. And uh, the one we got in March of 2020, I was able to collect the blubber. Um, and I think that one was one that Scott and Tree Mercer spotted and then um, told, you know, saw it was floating by and then it ended up coming in on a beach. And we did get those blubber samples from that one. Um, and I think it was an older female, it was at least an adult female. Anyway, it's, it's great that, that to see that, oh, those blubber samples are really, going to be looked at from the UME and great, you know, been fantastic. There's a reason for cutting out large chunks of blubber and, and sending them off and making sure that they are taken good care of. So yeah, anybody else wanna chime in, feel free to, to be a part of the conversation. Um, okay, there's somebody's asking, is pesticide lipophilia necessary? for efficiency and or application of the pesticide, or is it just a part of the chemical makeup? Um, did you understand that question? Yeah, Should no, that, that's a great question. And I don't think anyone's ever asked me that. I'm not sure because I'm not sure about, you know, the design of these pesticides or things like that for their application purpose, but I do know it's, it's part of the chemical makeup, but I don't know why, why these certain chemicals are chosen for, um, use in pesticides, but it, it's part of the chemical makeup. Interesting. And then uh, Andrew said, uh, I think the lipophilia is polar versus nonpolar. Um, now we're getting pretty heady. Maybe Jeff, will you read those questions <laughs> and interpret them and put, put them out so that we can... Uh, Andrew informs us that uh, li lip lipophilia is polar versus nonpolar thing. Um, Water soluble toxins just saturate and pass through water versus oil, polar versus nonpolar molecules, and, and water in particular is, is so different from fat. Doesn't oil and water don't mix because water is polar and oils are nonpolar. That's why you get those slicks on the top of the surface and all that. And um, from what I understand in, in current testing of new pesticides, and there is quite a movement towards. Uh, away from these chemicals to other ways that are as effective, um, et cetera. So we've come a long way since the DDT days is, is one take home of this. And it may have shown up in the, in the gray whales 
Um, we know better now, if we can just act on that data, then the world could be a better place. Unfortunately, though, like even down in Southern California, you know, they put that DDT off of Palos, you know, Palos Verdes for so long that even though we know better now, it's going to be affecting things for a long time because there's just so much of it that was dumped out there that is now, you know, that we think is potentially causing issues. So it's uh, something that we're continually watching down here, especially with California sea lions. We're seeing quite a bit of, of cancers and things like that showing up. And so it's you know, we're really trying to watch to see, you know, how much DDT and those types of things that we you know we dumped in the ocean because we're so good at that dilution is not the solution um you know it, it's it's still a problem for us unfortunately it's pretty scary justin do you want to explain that that little the the, the uh, study with the california sea lions a lot of people are really shocked to learn that 25 percent of the california sea lions that actually not 25 percent of the population but 25 percent of the california sea lions that get to one of our marine mammal centers that are studied actually have urogenital cancer that could be linked to the herpes virus, that it could be linked to that DDT. Do you want to speak to that for a minute? I, I find it just shocking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's again, why we do what we do is that, you know, these animals are telling us something. And, you know, in particular, we do find, you know, like you said, about 25% of these animals are, are having particular types of cancers. And that's, you know, cancer is usually, you know, typically something is going on here, you know, it's, it's an added, something's added to your body that's creating this problem. And so that's what we're trying to figure out exactly what it is. And it could be a couple of different things. Like you said, it could be the DDT thing. It could be, um, the, the, you know, the transferable like herpes type of something that's going on. And so we're really trying to figure that out as to what, what it is, but, you know, pumping these, you know, putting the amount of chemicals and pollution and things that we did into the ocean and, and continue to do, let's be honest, um, you know, not certain things like DDT, but, you know, other stuff that we're putting out there is, is problematic. I mean, it, it's even now, I mean, with the harmful algal blooms, that's, that's, that's kind of the big thing now too. And that's, you know, it's not us necessarily directly pumping things in, but, you know, as when it rains, all of our nutrients go out into the ocean and now we've got these giant blooms and then it's, you add a little bit of sun to it and you get these giant blooms and it creates these harmful algal blooms, which are affecting seals and sea lions. I mean, we're, we've even, we're finding it in background levels and gray whales, you know, we're finding it in a lot of animals, not to the point where we think that's causing issues for all of them, but you know, it is out there. And so this is what we think is really important about the, the stranding network is that, you know, in harmful algal blooms, you know, you guys know about this, they shut down the Dungeness crab fishery because of harmful algal blooms. So these things are affecting people. And that's why we really value the stranding network and the work that is done to, to figure these things out, because ultimately the animals that are swimming out there in the, in the ocean near shore are canaries in the coal mine forest. They're using the same habitat. They're eating the same things that we're eating. Um, they're exposed to the same things. And so as humans, uh, this is kind of scary, you know, we should be expecting to see some of those very same things, you know, in us and um, not surprisingly, we, we do. And so it is, you know, that's, that's what I really, you know, for me, the stranding network, it's important about the mammals, but I, I think it really, for me, the, the way that we really, you know, validate what the stranding network does for a lot of people is we tie it to human health, because that's, that's where, people become very interested in what's going on. And, and again, these animals that were coming ashore are pieces to this bigger puzzle of, you know, what is coming down the pike for us as humans? Because again, we're, we're in the same spot eating those same things. You know, we should not expect that we're just going to fly under the radar for those things. It's gonna affect us too. Right. Yeah, that's a great, great um, point to make around people that there are many people who are saying, why are you rescuing the sea lions? Why do you put so much effort into rescuing the sea lions? But interestingly, we had a Guadalupe fur seal that was reported to us that we rescued and she was an adult female and she had domoic acid toxicity um, and, and didn't make it. And we, 10 days before that, we had an adult California sea lion female up here. This, these are kind of interesting for us up here in this neck of the woods. We usually don't get the females and we usually don't get uh, domoic acid toxicity animals, even though some will swim up here and, and die up here. But those were two interesting cases that just came up in the last couple of weeks. Thanks to the people that reported them and that we, were, we had a rescue team, we could get out there. But look what we've learned from these two animals um, and beyond. You know, this kind of stuff is just phenomenal um, and so important when you're out there, uh, as we all are, on your crawl, when we can, uh, looking uh, and reporting stuff dead or alive to the, to the people that can um, get out there and learn something from them. 
I'm going to read that next. There's another question in the chat and somehow balance between the glasses. I'll and sneak in a comment first is that we've been talking about stuff that dissolves in the water and gets into the in the food chain there. There's a lot of study recently going on with aerosols. Uh, surfers off San Diego in the winter, when there's a flu crisis on shore, they get more colds. So the way that aerosols, COVID is transmitted mostly through the air and a lot of other viruses. We don't know how many gray whales yet that have gotten COVID, um, but it, it's gotten to the point where we got to put masks on whales. No, we, um, yeah, whale breath is no longer safe to hang around in perhaps. It is, aerosols are another vector for this that are just currently being looked into and, and wondered about, especially off big urban areas. We're actually doing research on the COVID thing right now. Our, our LA County facility is actually working with the health department and they're sampling all animals that are coming into their facility for COVID because the health department wants to know if the marine mammals are starting to pick it up and what's going on with that. So it is another one of those things where we're contributing to some kind of human health information and figuring out and looking at, you know, what, where is COVID going and what is it doing? Because it, it, it's obviously it's, you know, it, it is in mammals. And so there is a chance that it could go to marine mammals. Um, so we are watching for that as well right now. Oh, thanks for that. Wow. Yikes. Thanks for doing that. Yeah. Just a couple more questions. Let's see. Um, Andrew, again, it'd be cool if we could con to, if complimentary good stuff at our water treatment plants that makes the ocean more hospitable to threatened endangered species. For example, the runoff in L at uh, Balona Creek in LA tax dollars going to that. Yeah, if we could actually, uh, yeah, that's a, a big thought, Andrew, putting, putting good stuff back out into the ocean instead of bad stuff. <laughs> Hopefully there's some people that wanna pay for that. Um, and then do we know if the contaminants are stored uniformly across all fat stores in a whale? Good question, Catherine. That's a great question, Catherine. Also, hi. <laughs> um, no, they're not uniformly stored. And that's a really interesting question. Um, and there's a lot of great research coming out on stratification of um, there's like different strata of fat going up the blubber profile. And it's expected that the contamination could be different in these different layers, particularly because these different layers have like different functions for um, either thermodynamics um, or energy storage, things like that. So the turnover rate of contamination may be different across these different layers of the blubber and also different parts of the body. Um, so yeah, very good question. And also very important when comparing uh, biopsy samples versus necropsy samples um, to make sure that they're being sampled from the same layer and location on the body. Great question. Any other questions? If you if you if you have a question that you don't really want to write down in chat, um, we might be able to handle some raised hands. Although we do have quite a big audience here. Um, I had one. Go ahead, Sue. I just I didn't know if um, I know there was like a humpback, not humpback, excuse me, a gray well that showed up in Hawaii at some point in the last oh. month or so. Is there any? Has anybody found out like why that particular animal ended up over there? <laughs> Was it looking for you, Justin, when you used to live there? No. <laughs> no. I did hear about that, but I, I mean, obviously, we, we don't know why. I mean, we've, we've had elephant seals show up there. We've had, uh, I think, a Guadalupe fur seal once show up over there. So, I mean, I think it's just that migration around. I mean, we've also had gray whales show up in Greece and Italy. You know, I mean, they're, they are, they swim a long ways. And so I think it's one of those things where I'm guessing it's probably a younger animal, um, that just maybe uh, not knowing exactly where it's supposed to be going and how. And, and I mean, quite honestly, I mean, I would rather go to Hawaii than Southern California. So I don't know. Maybe it's uh, Good maybe point. Of the, one of the other ones don't. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. There's always an individual in the group. <laughs> we had one show up at Socorro Island one year, which is 250 miles south of Cabo. And then there's the whale that showed up in Namibia, which is in the Atlantic Ocean and south of the uh, equator and a recent study on the genetics of that whale link it more towards the Russian side of things. So it may be the example, first example of we have of that very small population going south through the China Sea and down and down and down looking for conspecifics and not finding them until they get to, yeah. We're all one ocean. 
Hmm. <laughs> um, oh, it says it was a juvenile in Hawaii, according to um, those someone's sources. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for all the great work, everyone. Um, let's see. Did you, can you see, I can't see. Oh, it, no, that's it. Is there any more questions in there, Jeff? Oh, uh, I thought Kia said that toothed whales are studied more than baleens. Is there a reason for that? Or are you finding different levels of contamination? Um, both. <laughs> um, there are a lot of different reasons for that. Tooth whales and pinnipeds are studied um, for contaminants more often. Um, for pinnipeds, definitely having captivity studies makes that a lot easier. And also even for toothed whales, some of them are just in more accessible locations. Um, and then on top of that, their levels are typically higher. So there's just a lot more interest in funding for um, a lot of toothed whale species. The, um, and the killer whale story was all analyzed in the, in the lab that Kia currently works in. And the killer whales that eat salmon had a lower level of PCBs than the mammal eaters and has reproductive effects. And the Southern resident killer whales aren't doing that well reproductively, but the, but the transients, the marine, the mammal eaters are doing great. They're having kids all the time, big, robust, traveling all over the, the place. And um, yeah, uh, the levels are so high in their bodies, they exceed the toxic, sta uh, toxic waste standards if they come up on the beach. It's illegal to touch them because their PCB levels are so high. But that wasn't true of our guy, of this guy, this guy here. This guy here. I didn't ever see that. That was, I mean, because I read that, I was like, "Watch out, you know, you're handling toxic material." If you oh, I forget we got transient we got, orca. We got results on that. I good question. We must have <laughs> right, Justin. Ago. <laughs> I yeah, I don't remember. Well, that one was the one that was entangled, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he was entangled. He was an adult male, um, somewhere in his in his possibly his thirties. Um, um, had, you know, five or six harbor seals in his belly when he stranded. So he, um, you know, incredible specimen here and people, scientists came from all over the place to look at different, um, you know, tissues, brain sample. Um, there were people from Stanford and UC Davis and the Marine Mammal Center and Cal Academy and Humboldt State and, um, you know, I think that some of those studies, some of the some of the science around him is still coming in. It took quite a few years to actually get like his age based on his tooth. Um, so sometimes you don't you'll get you'll get a stranding and you'll get all this information collected from an animal, and then years later you'll start to learn like you know what what it takes a while. You know, so if you have one of those great questions about well, why did that harbor seal die? Well, give it some time. We might actually be learning more. Um, give it some, you know, give it some years. Let the science keep asking the questions and let the scientists dive in um, and learn from them. For example, we're collecting the vibrasse or the whiskers from every um, harbor seal or sea lion from this area. So we're getting level A data, which is just like Justin said, the measurements, the species, the age class, um, the possible human interaction and whatnot. But we're also um, here at the Noya Center um, contributing to Cal Academy in, in collecting the skull and the whiskers and the tissue um, and to put down in at the California Academy of Sciences for future scientists to look at. Maybe the skulls are going to be different sizes. Who knows? It's just um, stay curious. It's wanna... the value of museums is that new techniques are being developed all the time that can go back into the history of those archives and learn so much more and like with Kia's study, now that with photo ID and we have life histories on individuals, uh, we, we know more about the Southern killer, southern killer whales because they've got health profiles on them. And you collect the poop out of them, measure from hormones and you figure out if the pregnancy carried through or not. On and on and on, it's amazing. Um, a good point. So is he in your database, Kia? You just recently remapped it, come on. Yeah, get me an idea and I'll, I'll look it up. <laughs> I'm curious too. <laughs> That's yeah, maybe, idea. Okay. maybe Sheila knows. Um, uh, to the Mercers, to Justin and to Kia, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and important life's work. And thanks to the Noya Center for bringing us this from Christine. Thank you, Christine. Um, 
yeah, anyone else, if you have anything else to ask or, um, you know, want to chime in, uh, this has been a lot of fun. Um, we hope to, you know, as we come out of COVID, we may see fewer virtual science talks, maybe more in person, but I actually hope for um, some hybrid because bringing everybody from all over and being able to just do this is, is actually pretty special. Um, and, you know, finding some way to do a little bit of in-person and virtual combination would be a, a great way forward. Um, so uh, I can't thank our speakers enough for being here and to thanking Jeff for coming down the, um, down the road and co-hosting this with me and to Trey mm -hmm. and to Sheila Siemens, our executive director who saw a vision and has carried us through to, to where we're at now. Um, and to all of you for joining us um, here for this science talk and for your continued interest and curiosity. Um, what, a, what a cool thing. Somebody else, okay, as being, will you read that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Is this being taped? Where will it be available online? Uh, it'll be on the, most of it will be on the uh, Noyo Center YouTube channel. I like that because our paper, Wakia's paper, um, uh, isn't published yet. And so we have to hold back some of that data until the publication's out. That'll be edited out. But um, maybe we can stick it back in after the publication. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. But also, Scott and Tree, I'm so sorry for cutting you off. I got a little nervous about the time. Um, but Scott and Tree are out there counting whales as they cruise by and they're doing an amazing bunch of work and they came up here and counted whales off of the crow's nest um, for a day and got 21, but they had 42 the day before from Point Arena. So uh, we got a windy, whippy, gray day with them. And, but the day before that was blue and gorgeous in Point Arena. So, um, and you can pop down and, and visit them out there as they count the whales. And um, just really thank them for for being a part of this, and to all of you. So yeah, that, Sarah, those those talks are also. I mean, not those talks. Those those counts are very valuable to us as well. When we have our UME calls, that's one of the things that we always discuss: is how you know what are people seeing? You know, what are those? What are the kind of three main areas that watch for whales seeing? And so that that data and that information that you guys are collecting up there and sharing with us is very valuable to us because it really does, especially over time when you can see those unique trends where you can see, you know, that you've got a significant lower number passing through what is causing that. And the fact that we're able to kind of figure out, like you were saying, you know, they split and they, you know, they kind of divide and then they get back together. And so, you know, we're figuring these things out over time, but the only way that we do that is by being able to consistently monitor and have something to compare it on and have some baseline um, you know, and the baseline stuff that, you know, when and where those animals are at is also very important. We just had an oil spill down here in Huntington Beach. Um, we were lucky it was super small, but if we have a big one, you know, knowing where these animals are typically at and what time of year and what they're doing there is very, very valuable because those are, again, our baseline data that we can go back and say, hey, if there was an oil spill during this time of year, pretty much all along the coast, there's a good chance that we're going to have gray whales getting involved in that. And so it's, you know, having these you know long-term data sets that provide valuable information are, are really critical and a key component to helping management make decisions uh, around these species so again really good job and a great presentation that shows you know what is happening over over time you know when you look at it in a single year it's it's interesting but when you get to look at it compared to 10 or 15 or 20 years you really start to suss out you know where things are changing and whether or not and it's it's a uh, very, very valuable. So really good job and, and really appreciate all the efforts on those. Yes, big thank you. And especially making up little graph showing and all the different animals that you see besides. So definitely added the added touches to it. So thank you all so much for the incredible work you do. Really grateful that we have such um, dedicated people out there keeping track, like Sarah said, kind of reiterating it, but my heart gets all big, just being grateful about it. <laughs> Yeah, I think in San Francisco, when those poor, when Sue and Mo and the and the folks at the Mammal Center were last year during the UME, they were up to, they just got a bunch of whales all in one and they were, they were reaching out to Sherry uh, Goforth, EB, who's in Wallala and to Scott and Tree. And they're like, tell us, 
are you still seeing gray whales? Do, can we possibly put our boots away? <laughs> and it and it was it was valuable to them. They're like, please tell us you're not seeing any more gray whales. When will they go? Because it was an intense, very concentrated number, a big number of of dead whales that were coming into the Bay Area. So um, keep looking out there. It's all important and. Uh, report what you see and stay curious and all of that. And um, I guess I will let everybody out of here and, and thank you all. Can't thank you enough for being here and let's, let's be in touch and have some more good science conversations. Yeah, definitely let me know if you guys ever have other stranding talks or things that you want information about. I'm happy to jump on. You know, the, the I would love to drive up there and be up there with you guys personally. But even in the in interim, you know, if there are things that you guys want questions, you know, just let me know. I'm, I'm happy to jump on and have conversations about marine mammals and strandings and, you know, how how that plays into kind of what's going on in California. So no problem at all. Wonderful, Wonderful Justin. We almost called you last week because... I, I had, I was, I picked up my phone. I was like, I got to call Justin because I got an entanglement report uh, from the crow's nest. And a few of our docents were like, an entanglement, call Sarah, call Justin, call, we got to do this. And uh, I got there and happily put these whales in my binoculars and saw that uh, there was more than one individual rolling about. Um, I think there were five whales at one point rolling about. And uh, we saw flukes, we saw peck fins. And um, the rather large pink uh, buoy that was reported. We're going to say, was there a pink buoy involved in this one? <laughs> there was. Anyone? And bless his heart, we had to really, really thank this gentleman so much for doing the right thing, which was yep. to look out there, see something that didn't look right, and to report it. And it would have you would have known about it within 10 or 15 minutes of that sighting because of our stranding network. It's a network that is, is all along the coast. And I've got Justin's number right here and I will call him immediately <laughs> if there's an entanglement. Um, our crew here at Noyo, our volunteers who are out there who know to call me. Oops. Oh, you froze. <laughs> we lost you, Sarah. Luckily, it was at the very end. Yeah, we made it this far. <laughs> exactly. Well, rather than belay, I will jump up. I really appreciate everybody. Thank you so much for your time. And again, uh, I really Thank appreciate night, all everyone. the efforts that are going on up there. So really good stuff. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank I you appreciate all. it. Thank you all of our volunteers for your help. Definitely. All right. Thank you.